chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita is Purushottam Yoga and Purushottam means Supreme Spirit, Supreme One, Spiritual Being. You can say that Purushottam Yoga means Yoga of the Supreme One. During the course of this chapter, we'll find out what the Supreme One is. This is the chapter where the reference is made to the eternal tree. The tree with its roots upwards and branches downwards. It's a very mystical, mysterious tree. What does this symbol mean? Does anybody have any idea? Anybody has encountered these verses before? Do you have any idea what it means? This is the tree which is, you can say, upside down. Hmm? So how does it look, this tree? Let's have a look at a, a tree that's upside down here. So that's how this tree is supposed to look. Do you see that? The roots are upwards and the, the tree branches downwards, the leaves all downwards. And this is this mysterious eternal tree. Of course, this is a symbol. A lot of the old scriptures throughout all the traditions of the world have referred to the spiritual wisdom in a concealed manner, through parables, through symbols. And the seeker needs to contemplate on this to discover the meaning of this. So Balaji says the tree represents us. So Balaji, can you explain that? How is this supposed to be you, an upside down tree? mentioned that uh, uh, our uh, bodies like that so this uh, we are we are upside down it represents upside down the tree mm -hmm. okay but so you don't know the exact uh, sort of the, the meaning behind it yes i had said that yeah. and uh, which is of course true this represents um the human life or even the any being, the life of any being, and this is how this eternal tree is said to look. So we will try to understand this a little bit further. Go back to the text and read a little bit from the text before I explain the meaning of these verses. Sri Krishna said, with roots upwards, with branches downward, there is said to be an immutable fig tree, Ashvatha, whose leaves are the Vedic verses. He who knows that knows the Vedas. Above and below are spread out its branches, grown through the gunas, with objects of the senses as the shoots. The roots are spread out below, resulting in the bondage of actions in the human world. I will continue to read also verses 3 and 4, since they are related to this eternal tree. Its form is not apprehended as it appears. It has no end 
no beginning or foundation. Cutting this tree of very firmly grown roots with the strong weapon of non-attachment. That higher state should be searched throughout, arriving at which one no longer returns, saying, I take recourse in that very Purusha from whom perennial activity commenced. So these are the four verses and these are the verses that basically are describing this tree, the eternal tree. So go back right to the beginning and we see that what it says is the roots are upwards, branches downwards and it calls this tree the immutable fig tree. Why a fig tree? Fig tree is considered to be very holy so it's a very auspicious tree and the one who knows this tree knows the Vedas. So how do you master the Vedas? By reading the Vedas? By learning them by heart? Maybe, maybe not. But we will see that we talk about the gunas here, the senses, and bondage of action. So clearly, here we are talking about the human body, including the mind, including the senses, and the interaction with the world around us. So I will show you another picture now, and that is. Hmm, this one. Many of you are familiar with this picture. This is the center of consciousness. From here emerges through Adi Prana here the Jivatman. Jivatman is made of the active and latent unconscious mind. Here in the latent mind the samskaras are stored. They play out in the dreaming state. Actually, your page is black. I can't see it. I don't know how it's for the others, but... Can you all see it? Yeah. Mikhailis, can you see it? Uh, yes, I can. You can? Okay, that's me. I'll go. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. <clears throat> so, this is then the unconscious mind. Everybody else can see it. Okay, good. And out of this emerges a conscious mind. And the breath, which becomes more gross, the body itself and the senses, and finally the world around. Now, what happens when I... Invert this. I just inverted it. And so, you see, it looks like this. I hope everybody can see it. So now, we have a center of conscious right on top. We have Adi Prana emerging from it. We have the latent and active unconscious. We have the conscious mind, we have the breath, we have the body and the senses and all the sensory objects. So, what is the seed? This is the seed from Purusha or center of consciousness. The first roots emerge and these roots are not going upwards like we saw in the tree uh, which I inverted. But the roots are going downwards. So that is Adi Prana. And then forms the trunk of the tree. This is the main part, the solid part which is keeping this really firm together. And that is a latent and active unconscious mind. 
then come all the branches. It's conscious mind. You see all the, the body appearing, the senses. These are the different branches and the leaves. This is how we are interacting with the world around us. So this is indeed the eternal tree. We go through this path here from Purusha, from pure consciousness, the seed grows, it grows and emerges outwards. This path is known as Pravritti Marga. And when you die, it, like a tree collapses, you know, it dies, but not entirely because the root is still there. This part remains, this is partially immortal. The main body dies, but this part remains. And once again, it emerges out of there. So, rebirth takes place. And why is there rebirth? It is happening because we have not cut it off from the very root. If you would cut it off from the very root itself, right here, then this cycle would stop. And this eternal tree would then, this seed would go back to where it came from. But this is called an eternal tree because this is life. This is whole of the world around us. It keeps coming and going. It comes forward. It retreats back. The hidden comes forward. And then again it retreats back within. Again. This process is known as manifestation. This is pravritti. If we want to end these cycles, we need to cut this tree from its very roots. And this is what the scripture tells us to do. It says that this is a very strong tree which is being strengthened. The senses are shoots, the roots are spread out resulting in bondage of action in the human world. So you have fruit as well on this tree. When you understand this idea, not just intellectually, but when you see this in your life around you, and you begin to experience directly through meditation this process of going through the different levels of consciousness and interacting in the world and going back in again, you begin to gain mastery. You are then the one who knows the Vedas. To know the Vedas is not merely to learn up the verses by heart like a pandit, but to have mastery over all Vedic knowledge means to understand this process of how the hidden comes forward and returns again. We experience this every night. Every night we go through this process backwards when we retreat from the conscious world we go to the unconscious mind and to the latent unconscious mind in our deep sleep state. And then again we come out from the unconscious to the dreaming state and slowly back into this worldly reality of ours. So we actually go through that process in a sort of smaller on a smaller scale every night but this happens to us all the time when you come forward in this life you live this life with this body and then eventually go back to that seed 
to the un unconscious or to the Jeevatman. Nobody understands how this works. It seems to have no beginning, no end. It keeps on the cycle of birth and death. If you ask, when did this start? Nobody has an answer. When is this going to end? No one knows. But we do know that if you cut this tree firmly from the roots, then you can be freed from this cycle of birth and death and rebirth. What is your axe? How will you kill or how will you cut this tree? The axe is non-attachment, vairagya. Those of you who are practicing meditation, you are learning vairagya. This is what you are learning in reality. You are learning vairagya. You are practicing vairagya. You are trying to see the different objects within your mind in a way that these objects do not disturb you. And when you are able to do that all the time, you are no longer bound to the jiva, to the unconscious mind. What you have done then is you have cut off the very roots. From the very roots you have cut it off and that will not grow again. This is, this seed is Purusha or consciousness. From that seed it all grows, it comes forward. And when you retreat back to the very seed, you do not have to return. It is from this seed that pravritti starts or this activity starts, it comes forward. When you return there to that sea and you're established there, you no longer have to return. Some of you may puzzle over this and say, hmm, but this tree, isn't it? It's nice to have a tree. It's the tree of life. This is how life is, isn't it? This coming forward and retreating and coming forward. Indeed, this is the tree of life from a certain perspective. This is what keeps life in the world as we know it steadily continuing. If all of us would cut off, break away from this, cut off the tree from the roots, the world would end. This is indeed the tree of life. Some of you may be familiar with the example from the Old Testament where Adam ate from an apple from the tree of life and he was punished. What are the fruits on this tree? We saw that these are the fruits of karma. This is the worldly experiences, the senses. And when you go out in the world and you experience, your senses engage with the material world, you have karma or actions. These are the fruit. You can partake these fruit. You can enjoy these fruit, provided you do so with vairagya. If not, you will be lost. And since... Most of us do not know how to do that. We get lost in ignorance, in that worldly plane. But if you know how to do this, understand the, the meaning behind the tree, what it means in our 
daily lives. Then we can learn to enjoy the things without getting attached. That is Vairagya. And that would mean eventually the tree is cut off from its very roots. It will not emerge again. And so this tree, from a certain perspective, you see it as a tree of life. But when you start having a deeper understanding and you see that the, this part where you're enjoying the fruits is at the worldly level, but if you are retreating and establishing yourself here, at the center of consciousness, this is life itself. This is where life emerged from. This is the source of life. So how can that be death? That is not death. That is life. That is pure life. And so, in a sense, our perspective, our understanding of the world is reversed. What you first considered to be life at this level turns out to be just dead matter. And what you thought was death here turns out to be the very source of life itself. And when you understand this, experience it, know it from direct experience and insights through deep meditation and contemplation, then you are the master of the Vedas then you are master of all knowledge. You have a profound and comprehensive knowledge of both worlds, the inner and the external world as well. A master of both. So this is why we must cut this tree to be free from the cycle of life, death, and cut it from its very roots. Else, there will always be a fall. Again, you will fall back to this material level. That is why in Christianity, one talked, they talked about Adam and Eve falling then to a lower plane, earth. Earth is at the body level here, the physical level. So you see all the traditions of the world had this deep spiritual knowledge and it was always coded in symbols and stories and parables. It is only when we have the direct experience through meditation that we begin to understand what these scriptures are telling us. So any questions on that? Any doubts from anybody? Anybody wants to share anything? <laughs> okay, I hope that was clear. This is one of the most uh, mysterious symbols from the Bhagavad Gita and uh, many people have puzzled over it and um, the diagram explains it actually quite well. Verses 5 and 6 
free of pride and delusion, having conquered the stain of attachment, permanently dwelling in spiritual knowledge, turned away from desires, liberated from the pairs of opposites named pleasure and pain, the undeluded ones go to that imperishable state. Neither the sun, nor the moon, nor the light illuminates that, going to which they do not return. That is my supreme abode. When you become desireless, when you have attained that state of desirelessness through vairagya, that is a state known as param vairagya. That's not vairagya or non-attachment related to a particular object, but it is a state in which you see all things as changing and impermanent around you. You see the play of the gunas. And that state, you, when you see everything as transient, the state of desirelessness, you are liberated from all pairs of opposites and are established then in pure consciousness. What eliminates this? This is the light of consciousness. It does not require any other light. During the day, day we have the sunlight that illuminates the entire world. At night, we have the moon. And in the moonlight also we can see quite a bit. Or you have the light of fire. All these lights give us light. But what gives them light? It's the light of consciousness. This consciousness is all pervading. And that is the supreme abode. <clears throat> that is the seed that we saw from which life emerged from which Adi Prana emerged. This is the highest supreme abode. And it requires no other light. In the world of the living ones, my own eternal particle has become the soul or jiva. It pulls the senses with mind as the sixth, whose basis is prakriti. Whichever body this Lord attains, and from whichever one he departs, he goes taking the mind and senses along in their repository, like the wind carrying fragrances ruling over the senses of hearing and taste and touch and smell, as well as the mind, the Jiva Atman experiences the objects of the senses. The stupefied ones do not observe him, whether endorsed with gunas, he is departing or staying or experiencing. Only those with the eyes of knowledge truly see. The yogis endeavouring see him dwelling within the self. The unwise who have not cultivated the self do not see him even though they endeavour. This, these paragraphs explain how life emerges from that seed. That seed is this eternal one. Paramatman, Atman, Purusha, Shiva, got many names, different names, whatever you want to call it. From there emerges the Jiva. 
and it has senses. The mind is the sixth sense. Manas is in charge of the senses. So in a way it is one of the senses. All these form the base of Prakriti. So what has happened is Shiva or Purusha emerges and becomes Prakriti, a playground. Whichever body you are in, Purusha is always there. He takes that form, he departs, and he takes a mind there with him, just like wind carries fragrances. The Jeev Atman is united with Purusha, or the Atman, and together they form this vehicle. So Jiva and Atman form Jiva Atman. They are always together. Those who are ignorant do not do not really see him nor nor understand that there is something deeper, that there is something like an Atman. Only those who have knowledge can see that. The yogis who have now acquired a finer vision, a subtler vision. Those of us who practice meditation, who are beginning to acquire finer feel for these matters. If you begin to get a hint of this, that there is something deeper beyond the senses and beyond the mind that is experiencing all these things. So the two are united, Purush and Prakriti, or Jiva and Atman together. Just like wind carries fragrances, it goes then from body to body. When we begin to really get a deeper insight into this process of birth, death and rebirth, It brings a great deal of firmness in the practice. This in turn brings you insights and the insights in turn confirm the, the teachings. So it is a long process but it's important to understand this. This was explained in chapter 2 in Sankhya but it comes back again after Arjuna has acquired a glimpse of Vishwarupa. He's had a direct insight. Only after he has a direct insight are some of these matters repeated and strengthened the, the basic ground Philosophy, the basic philosophy is emphasized. That brilliance which remaining in the sun illuminates the entire world. That which is in the moon as well as the fire, know that to be my brilliance. Having entered the earth, I uphold the beings with energy. I also nourish all the plants, having become soma, whose nature is all juice and flavor. I, becoming the universal fire in the belly, dwelling in the body of breathing creatures, joined with prana and apana, digest the four kinds of foods. I am also situated in the heart of all. From me proceed memory, knowledge and negation. I am the subject to be known through all the Vedas. The author of the Vedanta as well as knower of the Vedas am I alone. What is this brilliance that illuminates the sun in the entire world? The moon as well as the fire. 
what is this energy which nourishes the plants, which nourishes your body? All this is consciousness. Call it Purusha, call it Shiva, call it Chitta. Different names for pure consciousness. This is all pervading. This is the light of lights. This is that light which illuminates or gives you life. Have you seen a dead body? You may have seen the body of a dead animal, cat or dog. Utterly lifeless. When you look at it, you know that life has left it. What actually left? The body is the same. But we know something left. That is consciousness. It was that consciousness that was giving this body life. And the nature of consciousness is life itself. Any questions? Any comments? Okay, everybody seems to be quite happy. So I'll continue. Verses 16 to 18. There are two conscious principles Purushas in the world, perishable and imperishable. The perishable one is all the beings, and the absolute one is said to be imperishable. But the highest conscious principle, Purusha, is elucidated as the Supreme Self, Paramatman, the immutable sovereign, the one who has entered and then upholds and natures the three worlds. Because I am higher than the perishable and also beyond the imperishable, one, therefore, both in the world and in the Vedas, I am glorified as the highest self. We see through our own experience, all of us have seen that there are two aspects to life, and that is that all human beings perish. That part we all know quite well. All beings perish. Animals, birds, plants, all beings in the world perish at some point of time or the other. These are the perishable beings. But there is a part that is imperishable. That is Purusha or Paramatman, the highest from Paramatman, this consciousness enters the body and nurtures the three worlds. Which are the three worlds referred to here? The three worlds referred to here are waking, dreaming and deep sleep. When the universal consciousness becomes individual consciousness. It becomes the sovereign of the three worlds. And we're actually referring to the universal consciousness here. Where is universal consciousness in this diagram? Can anybody show me where universal consciousness is? Does anybody know? Anyone? 
everything here, this whole white page is, this whole entire white page is universal consciousness. That is the playground. When that in a concentrated form here, we see, becomes a seed. It becomes individual consciousness. And when it is individual consciousness, from it emerges the, the three worlds, then it becomes the sovereign of these three worlds. <clears throat> the deep sleep, the actor unconscious, and the conscious Plane of conscious. Uh, so these are the three words. One, two, and three. Yeah. And this becomes the sovereign. The center of consciousness becomes the sovereign. When you are established here and you cut the tree from its roots from Adiprana, this connection to the unconscious mind is lost because there is nothing left in the unconscious mind. It's been purified. This is, so to say, cut loose. What happens to a drop? What happens to a drop of water when, when you put it into the ocean? It becomes the ocean. And this is exactly what happens when the jeev, the jiva is been freed. The Atman goes back to this ocean of consciousness. It, in a way you can say it, it expands into universal consciousness. It goes back to where it came from. So the perishable ones are those that have a jiva. The imperishable one is one who is liberated, who is free. Who returns to the universal self, Purushottam. Verses 19 and 20. The undiluted one who knows me this way as the Supreme Spirit, he, all-knowing, devotes himself to me with his entire being, O descendant of Paratha. I have taught you the secret most science, O sinless one. Awakening to this, one becomes endowed with the wisdom fulfilled as to all actions, O descendant of Bharata. Sri Krishna ends this chapter by saying that the one who experiences the all-knowing devotes himself to this journey. Kalpana, did you want to say something? Okay, then I will just mute you because <clears throat> it's causing an echo. So if you want to say something, then maybe you put it in the chat. There seems to be something with the system today. It is this devotion, which is a longing or a thirst, that leads us further. Those who do not experience this glimpse that Arjun experienced may not have the same longing and devotion. But however the longing and devotion may be, nurture that. A 
love that longing and thirst to grow until it becomes so strong that all other things seem to fade away. This is the secret to science. Explaining the meaning of this tree is not merely an intellectual understanding, but through direct experience, through meditation, you can see it for yourself, just as Arjun saw a glimpse of the cosmic self, the Vishwarupa. Similarly, you will get a deeper insight into this which cannot be compared with any intellectual study of any scriptures. As Sri Krishna is proceeding the Bhagavad Gita, is going through the journey as well. It began with a elaboration of the basic philosophy, which was the Sankhya philosophy, it went into karma and how to how it influences your, your life and how it interacts, causes destiny, fate, how you can change and transform your daily life through your actions. He then went into details of Dhyana or Raja Yoga. When Arjuna requested a glimpse, because he said, yes, I understood all these things at an intellectual level, but I have no experience, then he received a, a glimpse. That was Kundalini. And then Sri Krishna proceeded to systematically talk about higher levels of insight, how this world is created, how the qualities that we have are continuously changing, how to become a witness. And now, in the next chapter, he elaborates upon the demonic and the divine qualities. Chapter 16 is called Divya Asura Sampat Vibhag Yoga, which means the divine and demonic qualities, the division of these divine and demonic qualities. The chapter covers, it's a short chapter, and it, it explains basically there are two main kind of qualities, those that are divine and the others that are demonic. Earlier we learned about the gunas where we said there were three kind of qualities, sattva, rajas and tamas. But now here it says there are two kinds. If we study this, you will see that basically the divine qualities are sattvic and all others lead to ignorance and these are demonic. So let us try to understand these two main divisions and the result of these qualities. The Blessed Lord said, Fearlessness, purity of mind, stability in the yoga of knowledge, charity, control, sacrificial observance, self-study, asceticism, and simplicity, non-violence, truth, non-anger, selflessness, selflessness, peace and non-gossiping, kindness towards all beings, non-greediness, mildness, modesty, non-fickleness, brilliance of confidence, forgiveness, sustenance, purity, non-animosity, non-seeking of honor, these appear in one who is high born in divine wealth or descendant of Bharata. Verses 1 to 3 elaborate upon 
the divine qualities. These are the characteristics of a person who is divine in nature. It doesn't mean that he has to be a god, but he has some noble qualities. He or she is sattvic in nature, maybe fearless. Fearless doesn't mean that you have to go and fight all sorts of you know, uh, evil things, but you can show fearlessness in very small things in day-to-day -day life. Purity of mind, simplicity, speaking truth, learning to be selfless, being peaceful, not gossiping. These are things that we can all relate to. These are all positive qualities. If you look at them more carefully, you can ask yourself, how many of these qualities do I really possess? And you will find out how sattvic you are. Most of us are mixed. We also have some demonic qualities. The word demonic sounds quite um, strong and we don't like to think of ourselves as demonic. So it's confusing, but when we study the demonic qualities, you will see that all of us have some of these traits. To use another word, we can say some evil tendencies, some negative tendencies. And you will see that most of us are mixed. So what are these demonic or evil tendencies? Hypocrisy, pride, seeking honor, anger, harshness as well as ignorance. These occur to one born to demonic realm. Hypocrisy is, uh, can be quite a big problem for most spiritual seekers because there's a very strong tendency to start behaving in a yogic manner. So, it's not like you have all these positive qualities, so if you don't have them, you start pretending to act like you have them. So even if you enjoy gossiping, you will pretend not to gossip or you will force yourself not to gossip. If you are greedy, you will try very hard to be not greedy. But in you, these are there, these samskaras are very much there. So you act, you become a pretender. And so hypocrisy is sometimes one of the qualities that is often seen in spiritual seekers. Pride, seeking honor, these are common qualities among most worldly people. Anger and harshness, in fact, is very much a sign of those who are most honest and uh, natural. Those of us who are trying to be yogic tend to suppress the anger and try to be very sweet and, and nice. But in reality, this uh, anger has just been repressed. So these are some evil tendencies. I'm sure that you will find there are also some things that you will say, yes, I could, I could work on my anger or sometimes I get very proud. And we all have a bit of both. What is the result of these qualities? Because these qualities or way of life lead either to freedom or to bondage. Divine
qualities lead to freedom. And the demonic way is known to lead to bondage. Grieve not, O Arjun, you are born to divine wealth, O Pandava. So, Arjun, he says, is got a lot of divine qualities, he's got sattvic qualities. Indeed, it is a sign of a spiritual warrior. Arjun is a, not a warrior who goes really to some sort of wars, but his war is an internal battle. It's a spiritual war. And so for that he needs sattvic qualities, which he possesses. So I think it's almost time to end and this is a, a rather long um, verses 6 to 20 are quite long and uh, maybe it is best that we stop here before I read and explain this um, it's a better idea to stop here we have already seen the basic result of the divine and demonic qualities. It's just elaborated upon further. We will continue then um, next Friday. And um, if anybody has any questions or comments before we end, anybody would like to? Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I can uh, hear. Yeah, Radhika, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I want to ask one question, mm -hmm. and uh, it's from the former chapter, which you just ended, mm -hmm. like the earlier one. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that like, um, like after we get a glimpse of the, um, after we cut down that tree, we will return to the source, universal consciousness. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. And... Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, like after, uh, like uh, after getting um, self-realization or uh, that, uh, you know, like glimpse of the highest, do we lose our individuality, all of our individuality? Like you said, a drop, a drop returns to the ocean, and likewise we also return uh, to the infinite consciousness or universal consciousness. And at that time, do we lose all our individuality? The question is, what are you considering individuality? For most people, the person who is... I'm not referring to you. I'm just saying that most worldly people are identified here at the level of worldly objects. Okay, These are the senses in the body. So here means these are objects of the world. So it may be a house belonging to somebody, it may be a car, it's a job, and you're identified with that. So if you have somebody who is a doctor, he's identified with his job. And if his job goes, he loses his job, lawyer, doctor, manager, whatever, then his world collapses. So his identity, his self-identity is, is, is questioned, is under attack. You know, So for, for such a person, the identity is related to worldly objects. If he has a fantastic car and <laughs> the car gets scratched, again, his identity is being, you know, attacked. For those who are attached to the body level, you know, they want to look beautiful and they want to look in a certain way and they do all sorts of things and dress in a certain way, they are identified to the body. Now, for a person who is very identified to the body, death at a physical level is a loss of individuality. If you are identified at a conscious level of the mind, and if you are identified with, um, with this idea of being, as I said, a lawyer, a doctor, a manager, then even the loss of that job means a loss of identity. So it depends on what you identify with. And that's why for most people, the question, who am I, 
leads to <laughs> I'm my house, I'm my car, I'm my job, or I'm my body. Because that's what they're identifying with. And these are the layers or the veil that we have to drop. Because you are not the house, you're not the car, you're not the job. And you're not the senses, you're not the body. And as you keep meditation, you keep doing it, you discover you're not the breath. And then you start studying the mind. And then you get attached to thoughts. And you think, well, I'm the thoughts. I'm a bad person because I have bad thoughts. You identify with those thoughts. And so you keep condemning yourself because the more you do meditation, the more you come in thoughts initially that are not very nice. And you may have a bad thought about your best friend. And you say, what a bad person I am. I'm thinking like this about my best friend. Or you are jealous of your brother or sister. And then you say, oh, I'm such a bad person because I have bad thoughts about my siblings. And so that's the identification at this level. And when that is attacked in some form, then your identity starts collapsing. And in fact, that is what meditation is. Meditation is a systematic method of dropping all these little petty um, self-identities until you finally discover that this is what you are, pure consciousness. And when that goes back to the ocean, what are you then? You are the ocean. There is no loss of identity in that sense. You have expanded, not contracted. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. I hope that was a little useful. I'm not too sure whether that helped. Um, so I hope that was a little bit helpful. I just would like to say that this is actually a fairly long process here. It looks so small here, but the whole process of going inwards is a fairly long process of self-observation and uh, non-attachment, which helps us to let go of these petty self-identities, whether it is at the level of objects, worldly objects, or body, or, or even at the level of mind, emotions, thoughts, memories. And then when you start coming in this field here already, uh, it is a very advanced stage. You would be an adept at that stage. And... Uh, this kind of experience of expansion, uh, most of us do not know from our worldly activities. Therefore, the laws of the internal world are very, very, very different from the laws of the external world. And that's why we stumble about it in the beginning. And that's why we say it's actually not about learning, it's about unlearning. And that unlearning is really the crux of the matter. And when you start unlearning, you're not the house, you're, you're not the car, and you're not the job, you're not the body, you're, you're not these thoughts, you're not even the negative thoughts that you, that you have once in a while. And so you condemn yourself, but you're not those thoughts. And you're deeper, you're much deeper, and then you... When you come there to pure consciousness, it's a sense of expansion. So the whole process is not about contracting, it's about expanding. And your identity is constantly expanding and becoming universal. So it's a beautiful process if, if one sees it that way. And if you see it as a loss of identity, then you might just miss the point. So don't see it as a loss of identity, but see it as an expansion. Okay. So with that, we end our meeting. And I see that somebody just joined, Manisha, but I think maybe you got the time wrong because um, we started an hour ago. So maybe next Friday. 
Okay, then see you everybody. Hope you have a nice weekend and I hope you enjoyed finding out how to cut down the eternal tree. And maybe you can do it too. Bye everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Most welcome, Roseanne, after a long time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, bye, Nicholas. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye, my dear.